thanks for having me again, Nuno. So uh, welcome everyone. I'll talk about some major developments that will impact the future for all of us. So the future for you. So one, 150 will be the new 50. We're gonna be in a world where aging can be reversed, aging damage can be reversed, and this will all be uh, rapidly improving our lives probably within uh, 20 to 30 years. So what am I talking about? There's been over $12 billion invested in over 160 companies. Uh, some of the biggest things were there's Evolution with an H, that's a, a Saudi fund that's investing $1 billion per year. So not just $1 billion once, but $1 billion every year. And they've been doing that for the last uh, two or three years. There's Altos Labs, Jeff Bezos, and um, uh, Yuri um, Milner, I think his last name, a Russian billionaire, have invested into Altos, a total of about $3 billion. So there's about 17 companies that are um, publicly traded on this now. So there's a lot of activity in, in anti-aging um, startups. And one of the most interesting areas is changing uh, epigenetics. So there's their DNA and then epigenetics control what's on or off, regulates the actions of the, the DNA. And so it's, it's looking like, and that, the, the epigenetics changes over your life. And it looks like there'll be uh, ways to use um, epigenetic modification to change the actions of our genomes um, across um, all, of our, all of our cells. And this could be a potential path, a rapid path to improving aging. And this kind of approach, and many of the approaches that they're looking to use, um, we're adding in genes to cells, but not changing our DNA, um, is something that you can just have an injection. So just that like we just had the pandemic with um, a vaccine given to billions of people, there'll be injections or, or drug medicine that will be able to um, affect aging for billions of people at low cost. And they've been work where they've done, various people have done work on multiple gene therapies to um, enable this kind of aging reversal. One of the things is that some people say, oh, this aging, aging can't be done, humans are more complex than these other animals. One thing to be clear about is that we should at least be able to get to 95 to 100 because there are significant populations on earth now. Um, uh, women in Monaco uh, live to about 94. Monaco is a small country, 20,000 people in Europe, but then also some 100,000, I mean, a few million Asian women in the United States can live to 94, and particularly around New Jersey. Um, and then there's all these people who live to 100 without um, having any kind of mental decline and do not get um, sarcopenia, which is um, muscle wasting. So people can live very, very healthily up to 95 to 100 already. And then with this powerful new technology, we'll be able to live even longer. One of the other areas that's highly um, the indicates that this is a, a promising approach and, and our technology getting far more powerful is Google's DeepMind AlphaFold 2 has recently solved protein folding. This was a, considered a grand challenge that we would not be able to achieve. And over the last two, three years, DeepMind, which previously solved the games of chess and Go, uh, which I think they didn't think they could solve Go, but you know now they solve Go and they now also solve protein folding. They've given up... Um, the three-dimensional structure of proteins because it folds up into this uh, spaghetti-like structures and they don't predict it highly, highly accurately. Um, and this is changing the science of, of biology and proteins as they're able to determine um, how to make drugs out of, out of, out of the proteins. So a highly promising area that kind of interplays with that and how advancing AI is speeding up the science of biology and also speeding up the science of, of physics and other complex areas. But people concerned about things like global warming and climate change, I'll describe how this is uh, less of an issue, something that we can get control of with, with technology. China is building out greenhouses at, at a global scale. They've already built about 2 million hectares of simpler greenhouses but they have a ministry that's announced and they've funded and they're well on the way to completing by 2025, the greenhouses supply half of their food. So China's population, about one fifth of the world's population 
half of their food is, is 10% of the world population would be getting food from these large scale greenhouses. And greenhouses are advantageous because they're 10 to 20 times more dense. So one acre of, of <clears throat> greenhouse can supply 10 to 20 acres outside of it because it's just more efficient at growing. You don't have to worry about the, the bugs, you have temperature control, and also use 10, 20% less water. So the water we drink is actually a smaller portion than the water we use for industry or for agriculture. So if, if agriculture water is 30, 40% of the water we use, if we use only 10% of it, then we're only using 3%, we're made, making major water savings. And that means we can have, by identifying food production in a major, major way, we then have more room for trees. And trees, and the way they can do it even better with greenhouses with the robotic greenhouses that could get 30 times more efficient. But we can plant trees. So people talking about carbon capture, trees have been carbon capturing for, for tens of millions of years. And because the, the wood of a tree is, you know, 50% or more CO2. So there's 3 trillion, 4 trillion trees in the world. There used to be 6 trillion. We're, there's room to add another trillion trees, but if we were to have less farmland, which we use half for farmland, half for forest, we can then shift over to adding room for another two trillion trees, which would be enough to absorb a trillion tons of uh, CO2. A trillion tons of CO2 happens the amount of CO2 we've emitted since the beginning of the industrial age. So 1800 to now is about a trillion tons of CO2. So not talking about the 30 to 50 billion tons of CO2 that we emit every year. That's a common thing you talk about. They say, oh, we need to spend $100 trillion to fix that or, and go out many, many decades. Over the lifetime of growing a tree, which there's fast growing trees that can get pretty mature within five to 10 years. If you grow, get the room for trees, plant them quickly, you can then have a climate change impact. <clears throat> One of the proof cases of this that, that show the work, because people talk about going back to the ice age 10,000 years ago. If you look back over 50 million, 100 million years, there have been cases where the, the temperature of the earth has swung by you know, 20 degrees Celsius or more. And actually 98% of the time, it's been far hotter than it is now. And when we drop from 20 degrees hotter to, to our current temperature, the colder, was when there was things like the Azolo event where we grew a lot of plant, a lot of plants grew on the surface of the ocean and then died and went to the bottom of the ocean. So it's the biological processes that will be able to solve the climate change and we'll have a, a better, more um, you know, green world when that happens. The other area of, of our future that will be far better than me expect is space. So a little over 50 years since the Apollo landing SpaceX is, is changing space. So it's not just the rocket, the, the Starship super heavy rocket that you see here. The Starship being the top black portion, the bomb portion being the super heavy booster. There is a launch tower. The launch tower is 480 feet tall, just 10 feet lower than the standard for a skyscraper, 490 feet, about uh, 45 stories. That launch tower with the arms that you see on it will catch the, the rocket. Uh, both pieces will come back and will catch it on that uh, on that those launch tower arms. <clears throat> Why is that hugely important? It is important because the the, the rockets themselves, I mean, even without most of the fuel out of it, we weigh 100 tons for the top part, 200, 300 tons for the bottom portion. Okay, there's really huge and heavy. So typically, you see these crawlers moving the space shuttle or other big rockets, which move at like a kilometer. Per, per, per hour, it's really, really slow because it's super, super heavy, okay? The fastest they've turned around launching Falcon 9, a smaller rocket than this, is about 21 days, okay? If you land on the launch tower, refuel, and launch again, you can relaunch the bottom booster in, in an hour. Similarly for the top, but the top will may go around in orbit, come back in a day. So you'd have like multiple uh, top starships for each of the, the bottom boosters. And then you'd have these launch towers, but, and a lot of them to catch and, and, uh, and then relaunch them. And that's how we get to hourly space launch. 
which is very much like how many flights go off from a runway from an airport where they take off maybe you know five to ten times every hour we begin very close to that instead of like once a month you're launching once an hour which is a thousand times more so rockets that can fully reusable taking 10 times as much material uh, up to orbit and then the launch tower enabling hourly launch for a thousand times more combined 10,000 times more space capability. And this could be launched to orbit and return to the launch tower. Space is very applied for that. Perhaps um, September, October timeframe. Highly likely before the end of the year. There have been certain delays, but this is how that game will happen, is that the launch tower, which you can think of as a giant robot, because the arms move very quickly. Uh, it's just if, if feet don't move, will be catching and launching these rockets. So SpaceX has already been changing space. This image shows the, the real-time views of, of the Starlink satellite network. This is one half of the Earth, so we're seeing 1,300 of them, and then the other half of the Earth would see the other 1,300 that have been launched so far. Over two-thirds of the satellite currently in orbit are Starlink satellites. And they're going to continue to launch these and get up to uh, 12,000 in the first wave of these satellites. Then they're going to switch over to Generation 2 satellites, which will launch from the larger rockets, the Starship. And then those larger um, satellites will have five times the bandwidth capability of these current smaller ones. So basically then they'll go from a half million current Starlink users filling up the current, um, the 12,000, from 2,600 to 12,000, supplying about 20 to 30 million people with the um, internet, and then scaling up to 200 to 300 million people. Each one person paying about $1,000 per year. When they get to the larger system, that's about $300 million per year. Pretty much all profit after you get past about $10 to $20 billion in revenue. And that massive economic capability will enab enable them to build far more uh, starships, far more uh, launch towers, you can think of the launch towers as spaceports. So if you have airports, you have spaceports, some on the ocean, some on land, and that will first enable um, cargo to be transported anywhere on Earth within an hour. The U.S. Defense Department and Space Agency already paid um, uh, SpaceX about $150 million to, to do a test military load to deliver something in under an hour. And then this will enable a next level FedEx delivery you know, t twice a day, three times a day, deliveries, and then hourly deliveries, and then people, once they've proven the safety of, of launching that often. Then there's the Tesla bot. Tesla bot is something that's going to, that uh, Tesla will discuss in their AI Day 2 coming up at the end of September. They have already previously discussed it. I believe that the humanoid robot uh, can be done because there's been the Honda Asimo humanoid robot, there's the Boston Dynamics robot, and those organizations have spent 100 times less money than Tesla will spend on, the, on their humanoid robot. So the functionality of getting the robot humanoid is less important, you know, less of a challenge with the, of, of the goal of making uh, a labor replacement than the AI. And the AI they're already using on the full self-driving software that they have for their car. They just made 3 million cars and they're increasing that, you know, uh, in total uh, over, the, over the, the time that they've been building Tesla cars. And all of them, vast majority of them have the capability for self-driving with the cameras and the chips inside to do this. So they will apply that full self-driving to identify objects for the robot, put that software to identify objects. And this will happen far faster than people think. This is a screen for something called um, um, digital self-management. So inside the factories that Tesla has, they have screens that tell the workers, you know, like a paint station, okay, I have a score in the um, left corner here, 53, showing that there's a bunch of uh, paint problems, dots on the hood of this car. So then the people know, okay, I need to apply certain paint changes and, and fix this up. So we have a scoring system 
for each of the stations at the in the type of Tesla factories. So then the, the, the robots will be able to, the Tesla bots will be able to apply that scoring um, system as a scoring neural net function. So they can then use that to improve the neural nets of the robot at each station. And the way the Tesla factory they're laid out, they're not laid out with um, production lines, they're laid out in with production work hexagons. So those work hexagons means that they have multiple stations for painting. So I can have four human paint stations and then one human robot mix and then or one complete robot uh, station. And if that robot station still haven't figured things out yet, it's irrelevant because they have redundant uh, other stations for humans to complete the factory work. But when the robot station gets better, then I can convert that over station by station over to ro robotic work. So that's how they will develop that to enable um, labor replacement. And then the, the space work and the Tesla bot and automation combine to develop Mars. Because if I'm making a thousand starships and launching them every two years with the launch window opens to Mars, I can then transport the contents and the structure of an entire gigafactory. A gigafactory in China has 15,000 workers. So I could transport that number or 10 times that number of Tesla bots and other equipment over to Mars to land a gigafactory on Mars to build more starships, to build more, more uh, electric vehicles or to build buildings or to build more Tesla bots. And then they would be able to replicate, to mine the materials of Mars to build more gigafactories. So once you get that mostly autonomous, um, self-sufficient, then you would be able to then start replicating that. And the more you get cl closer to replication, then the less other materials you need to bring from Earth. It'll be something that will go from 90% that you bring from, uh, that you build locally on Mars, 95%, 99%, and eventually 100% will all be on Mars. And you can spread from there throughout the solar system. So they can go from Mars, start replicating, build thousands, a million gigafactories, building bots, uh, solar panels, and everything else. And then you expand from Mars to the asteroid belt, to the Kuiper belt uh, beyond Pluto, and then to the Oort comet cloud. And then you have enough capacity to build out a million times more. And you could do this with how fast you're doubling up to achieve this exponential, true exponential growth for humanity. So that, that's uh, well, I was talking about that there's humans can have long lives, we can solve climate change, we can, we'll have AI robots that will supplement our labor, make, make us rich, and then we'll use them to spread across the solar system and scale up civilization by a million times. So that's the future and something that could happen far sooner than most people think. Thank you. Thank you.